So let's finish up Unit 2 by talking about conservation and ethics. We'll start with a brief history of conservation in Indiana. In 1849, Greene County, that's just to the, to the west of us, uh, very good fishing, outlawed to use a poison to catch fish. I don't even know how that's done. I'm very glad they did that. Um, 1867, there was a statewide ban on fishing with poison. This was right after the Civil War. So that's something I, I just totally don't understand. Um, 1881, the state legislature created the Office of Commissioners of Fisheries. This is the first formal legal um, enforcement of fishing regulations, the creation of fishing regulations. Um, it basically fell to the township commissioners to enforce any fish and game laws that were on the books. Now, fish and game laws are not a 19th century construct. Um, some of the very earliest recorded um, were back in about the 13th century, um, Scandinavia. There was a technique of catching fox, of making a trap out of a stump. And it was a very, very, very cruel uh, a way of, of catching fox. Um, uh, and that was outlawed in uh, England in the um, 13, 1400s. There were a tremendous number of game laws that were created by the monarchy, which at that period of time, the monarchy owned all the land and, and people were, well, literally serfs upon that land. And so taking the, the king's deer was a, was a capital offense. Um, 1911, game wardens were established, uh, $75 a month. This was just the bare beginnings of how we were starting to look at our natural world, our natural resources, and how those things should be managed. Uh, of course, we have our um, uh, Indiana Department of Natural Resources. I'd like to just take a, a moment about uh, talking about conservation officers. The, they use, this used to be uh, called game wardens. If any of you are in, you know, criminal justice studies, um, I would encourage you to take a very hard look at uh, um, the, uh, the conservation officer program. These are law enforcement officers for the state of Indiana, very much like state police. In fact, they have a little more powers than the state police do. When fish and wildlife regulations are, are written, they are given, uh, how should I say this, uh, a, a little more authority, um, a little more freedom uh, to enforce those laws. For instance, if a conservation officer has reasonable uh, suspicion to think that you've been poaching deer or fish or cr creating uh, some other violation of the, the uh, fish and game uh, regulations, they can inspect your property without a search warrant. If he thinks that you have, let's say, more trout in your possession than you are legally allowed to have, they can walk into your house and open up your refrigerator and start counting fish. They don't need no stinking search warrant. Now, typically this is not, not practiced very often, but if you've been uh, poaching deer and, and shoving them into a freezer in your garage, 
they can go into your garage without your permission and look for those. Um, this is a, a different realm than your normal, you know, you have to get a search warrant and so on and so forth. Uh, for e even, even drug enforcement it, the, has restrictions placed, which I think are, are very good. Um, just, just understand that uh, the, the DNR has a little bit more, more uh, power than um, uh, other agencies. If you're going down a road uh, to your favorite fishing spot and uh, you're going 20 miles over the speed limit, the DNR conservation officer can you pull you over and give you a speeding ticket. Um, if they suspect that you've been uh, uh, driving drunk, they can pull you over and give you a sobriety uh, test. If they believe that you have been boating drunk, they can pull you over and and give you a sobriety uh, test. So these guys have the full authority and in some instances more authority than any other law enforcement agency uh, in, in the state of Indiana, more than sheriffs, um, city police, state police. So don't mess with these folks. Um, they are unique in law enforcement in that there are very few of them. And if you think about it, their their job is to enforce the the state's fish and game regulations. This is a big state. There's not very many of them. You know, we have around, um, I think there's around 95 to 100 police officers in the city of Bloomington. There's, I believe, around a half dozen conservation officers for this district that we live in. And that district includes, I think, five counties. So, you know, if you do the math, there's not very many conservation officers. And these are incredibly brave people because they get a phone call 11 o'clock at night from old man Cedric that he thinks somebody's been poaching deer out on his south pasture. So these guys roll, get out, find a couple pickup trucks on the edge of the cornfield, five or six guys standing around, high-powered rifles, a couple bottles of Jack Daniels, and he or she has to enforce the laws. These are brave people. They can't call for backup. They are it. So consider this. Um, there, there's a, um, I'll drop a link in for some videos uh, that the DNR has put out about recruiting and requirements. Um, they're... they're uh, conservation officer uh, training camp which is very rigorous so anyway i have other stories about conservation officers i'm sure some of you have <laughs> as well if you are approached by a conservation officer just like any other law enforcement be polite answer questions their job is not to go out and arrest people there's a lot of paperwork and they don't like to do paperwork. They really do like to educate. I mean, I've, I've talked to several of them, and they say that that's how they really see their job as educators. If you have exceeded your limit of black bass, they're going to explain that to you. So who pays for conservation officers, for DNR, for fish hatcheries, for stocking programs? Well, you may have seen this sign in some of your favorite fishing areas. You do. Users pay for all of this. You and I, 
If you have ever bought a fishing license or ever bought a, uh, a hunting license, you are paying for this. In 1937, 1930s depression era um, Theodore uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, was elected president in 1932 we had the Great Depression in 1929 under Hoover um, things were not good people were out of work we had some environmental crisis um, namely the Dust Bowl out in the, the, the western states, um, which were greatly influenced by mismanagement of government. Anyway, another story. Um, there was not a whole bunch of wildlife. If you, if you recall from Unit 1, you know, deer had disappeared in the early 1900s, which is really hard for us to, to even comprehend now. Um, you know, wolves, um, buffalo, mountain lions, you know, everything was pretty much gone. And, and during the Depression, there was a lot of subsistence hunting. You know, people were just freaking hungry. And, you know, they, if you lived out in the country, you didn't have a, a, a soup kitchen, you know, nearby that you could get the, uh, get a meal. That was only for the city folks. And so if you were hungry, you did what, well, literally we've done for millennium. You went out and killed something and ate it. And it was getting to a point that there was just not a whole bunch of stuff out there to kill. I mean, rabbits were, were scarce. Uh, uh, squirrels were, you almost never saw a squirrel. So there were, were two senators, uh, Senator Pittman and Senator Robertson, who, starting around 1934, wanted to create some type of a program that would help the states rebuild their natural resources in the, the form of, of wildlife management. And so they came up with this scheme, and it was passed in the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. And the scheme was in very unique. These must have been some smart dudes. Because what they did is they... Instead of just, you know, raising taxes on everyone, they targeted the actual people that this would benefit the most, in this case, hunters. And so they proposed that a 10% excise tax be placed on all hunting equipment, firearms, ammunition, uh, hunting clothing, any accessory, uh, binoculars, um, scopes, any, uh, anything that you would use hunt, uh, for hunting, hunting knives, um, there would be a 10% excise tax placed on this. The excise tax was collected from the manufacturer. So if a manufacturer, let's say they produced a uh, thousand hunting jackets, uh, a year and, and, and sold those. They had to submit 10% of, of that uh, to the federal government. That money, that tax was passed on to the retailer, and the retailer passed that on to the consumer, the, the buyer. And, and so the person going in and buying a new hunting jacket would pay that 10% uh, tax. That money went to the federal government into a the Pittman-Robertson tax fund. This is where it gets really unique. That money was redistributed back to the states not based on, you know, land area, not based on population, but based on the number of hunting licenses sold in that state. So if you had a, you know, a big hunting state like Texas or Oklahoma or Montana, 
they would receive more money than a state like Delaware or Rhode Island that there was just not that many hunters. There was just, you know, they had more people, but it was more of an urban, you know, uh, type type setting. Um, so that, that money was equally distributed back to the hunters who are actually going to benefit uh, from this. And it worked incredibly well. Having some money, the states could, in, could do stuff. They could start... Um, uh, stocking programs. They introduced uh, deer, you know, back into into the uh, into the state. Uh, re- reintroduced turkey back into the states, and and so there's this wildlife restoration act um, really really benefited. And of course, you know, just the average person enjoyed seeing. Oh, look, a deer. Um, that was a a significant thing, you know, uh, back in the day, because there just weren't deer here in Indiana. Now we have too many frickin' deer. My wife's tomatoes just got raided the other day. Um, this worked so well that uh, Senator Dingell up in Michigan and Senator Johnson um, did the same thing for fishing in 1950 with the Dingle Johnson Act. And it, it, it placed that excise tax on fishing gear, uh, rods, reels, lines, hooks, bobbers, uh, sinkers, uh, lures, anything uh, related to fishing, tackle boxes, you know, had this, this 10% um, uh, excise tax. When I, I worked uh, uh, retail, in the outdoor industry for for about 15 years. Um, Canoes, kayaks, backpacking, camping, climbing, fly fishing, um, you know, that type of thing. And I I can remember, you know, paying bills to the uh, the, uh, Sims company, which produces uh, uh, fly fishing uh, gear. And it would break down an itemized list of all the product that we bought. And then there was a line that said excise tax, which was 10% of, of those total items. And then the, 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 the shipping you know, charges added onto it. So they broke out the actual excise tax so that you could see that um, uh, on each invoice. This did a tremendous amount of good for the fishing industry. And DNR, you know, um, uh, fisheries were, were able to, you know, do more stocking programs, better fish management, uh, research. And so we, we have all benefited very much from this. Uh, there were a few other acts. Um, the Wallop uh, Burrow Act in uh, 1984 um, added on, I believe, like motors. Um, trolling motors, boating-related items. Um, the uh, um, the T21 Act in 1998 um, kind of expanded that, and we have a like a five million dollar boat ramp down on Lake Monroe at Payne Town. It's a uh, a deep water all level boat ramp. Uh, in other words, the, the the lake would almost have to be dry before that boat ramp would be unus- uh, unusable. Um, very, very expensive. And that was paid for by the T21 Act. So um, that money is, is, you know, going back into the actual users um, that participate in these sports. Uh, other sources of revenue, uh, fishing license. When you buy a fishing license, that generates the Dingo Johnson Act money to come back into the state. So if you really want to help the environment, if you really want to help, you know, uh, wildlife in Indiana, I think you should go out and buy a hunting and fishing license. And DNR has made it very easy with their combo license. 
$25, you get both a hunting and a fishing license. That $25 generates money coming back in from these, both of these acts. You get more money generated with your $25 than just writing a check. Well, nobody does that by just giving $25. So I think it's very, very important that we do that. Uh, you'll see people driving with the environmental license plate. Um, that certainly helps. That kicks into, I believe, the non-game species fund for Indiana. And believe it or not, people just give money to the government. Here, take my farm, 200 acres, worth a half million dollars. That happens. That, that really does happen. There's various vehicles, various organizations that, that can make that happen. Um, uh, entrance fees at the state parks, what is it, seven bucks, I, I, I think now, or you can buy a pass for, I believe it's $50. Um, these help generate um, uh, revenue for, for the uh, DNR. If you get into making lures or hunting equipment and selling to your friends um, you need to file form 720 with your IRS uh, uh, federal income tax and if you go into canvas under files uh, there is the, um, uh, a copy of form uh, 720 uh, you can take a look at that and see how it's broken out line item by line item um, how to to file this this tax um, nobody knows anything about this I have talked to 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 hunters and fishermen and most of them 98% of them are totally oblivious on how any of this works and I, I think that's a real shame I, I think if people actually knew that Every time you went in and bought a new spool of um, uh, monofilament or braided line, that they're contributing um, money to the management of, of, of the fisheries program, um, I think it would make a, a, a difference. But DNR has not been known for their, their marketing uh, arm. So this is kind of a just a, an image of how all of this works. Uh, in the state of Indiana, uh, we have about 1.7 uh, million anglers, uh, fishermen, and we've spent about uh, just over seven million dollars on fishing in, in Indiana. Um, the economic output of all of we fishermen is about a million dollars that supports around eight um, eight thousand jobs and nationally these numbers get much 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 larger uh, 125 billion dollars economic output if if fishing was a fortune 500 company we would rank about, I think it's around 51 on the um, uh, Fortune 500 list. So it's, um, it's not a small thing. You can see right here that $628 million of excise tax has been collected um, uh, per year. I believe this is from 2018. Uh, Combined with the number of fishing licenses and donations, which, I mean, $275 million in donations, money that you have given the f agency of the federal government, that's, that's significant. You know, this total is $1.6 billion. There's almost 50 million anglers in the United States, and if you... you know, consider our population around uh, 325 million, that's not a bad ratio. You know, about one in five people fish. Freshwater anglers outnumber uh, saltwater anglers, which is not surprising. 
Um, the Great Lakes region, they've broken down to about 250 uh, million anglers, and so that's a, a pretty big number. If you come over to this website, the asafishing.org, these folks collect all kinds of data on fishing, on sport, and it's a tremendous resource if, if you guys really want to take a, a deeper dive into this. It's a, a very, very interesting website. If we take a look at a breakdown of different types of recreational um, endeavors based on age, we see some very interesting things. Fishing is number seven for six to 12 year olds over here. And that continues through the, the teen years, 13 to 17. But once you turn 18, fishing just kind of like goes away. It, it disappears. And in fact, even, you know, um, older young adults, 25 to, to 34, fishing's not there. You know, kayaking comes onto the, uh, onto the list, but, but fishing is gone until a person reaches about age 35 to 44, we see fishing back on this list at number nine. Hmm. Wonder why that is. And then, as you mature 45 to 54, fishing becomes really popular again. And as you age 55 to 64, fishing is still there. At age 65, fishing is up to number four, the highest ranking in this, uh, in this chart. What's going on here? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. You know, you folks, you know, college age, aren't fishing. And that's kind of understandable. I, in, this, in this class, I used to do things to try to encourage people to go out fishing, uh, you know, renting fishing gear, um, taking people fishing, um, fishing contests, things like this. And I, I finally realized that you guys are just too freaking busy for fishing those of you who do fish fish but just to try to get somebody to to take up this new endeavor right in the middle of everything else that you have going on it's just not going to happen and and i realize that and the 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 chart you know kind of kind of points that out but a lot of you will, you know, get married, you'll have kids, and when you're 35 years old, you will start taking your six-year-olds fishing. And those six-year-olds turn into 13-year-olds so very quickly that you still take them fishing. And then once those 13-year-olds fly the nest and be become 18-year-olds in college, tuition payments, housing fees, um, you actually continue to fish by yourself. And then age 65, maybe your children have had children, and then grandpa or grandma gets to take the 6-year-olds fishing. So, question for you. Uh, question for this for, for, for this video. Of, of you who fish, how many of you were taught by a, a relative, an, an, uh, an adult? How many of you just decided one day, you know, I've kind of mastered that ballroom dancing thing. Um, I think I'm going to try fishing now. Don't know anything about it, but I'm going to Give fishing a try. How many of you did this on your own with, with nobody to, to actually uh, uh, show you? The reason I ask is that in most studies, about 90, I think it's 96% of all fishermen 
were taught fishing by a relative. Parents, grandparents, uncles. This is not a sport that somebody, most people, just wake up one day and say, I'm going to get into fishing. And they go buy some gear, watch some YouTube videos, and go do it. Um, doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. Um, it's called a barrier to entry. It's incredibly high for fishing. It's incredibly high for hunting. And unless you are brought up in this, chances are you will never participate in any of these two sports. And this leads to a discussion on the future of the sport. So if you're not teaching your children this stuff, they're not going to, to know this. And we can see how the money flows that keeps everything going. Um, hikers don't contribute to any of this. Um, canoers, kayakers don't contribute to any of this. Uh, climbers do not contribute to the management of, of, the, of the land that they're, that they're using. And this will probably become a real problem. There was an effort back in the 90s <clears throat> to create an excise tax for outdoor equipment. Backpacking, camping, canoeing, kayaking, climbing... And it was soundly defeated. And not just like, no, we don't think that's a good idea. We don't want to participate in this. It was a hell no, and how dare you for even asking us to contribute. And that was about the time I started uh, rethinking my, uh, my vocation. And, you know, these were... In well, I'll say it. These are incredibly selfish people. And um, the idea of actually paying for the stuff that they wanted to do was, was just not not something that they would even consider. And um, so anyway, um, there we you go. We've kind of wrapped up uh, the conservation and ethics uh, lecture for uh, Unit 2. And oh, one more thing. Crap. So if we take a look at um, some numbers, um, I know, incredibly boring. I'll let you do most of this on your, on your own. I uh, just want to point out that 16.5% uh, of the U.S. population fishes. Uh, we kind of determined that from the, from the other slide. Um, new fishing participants account for 6% of the total participation, and they tend to be young. Um, yeah. Older people, adults, just don't pick this up unless they, they, they get into it. 84.2% um, of fishing trips result in a catch. So, if you went fishing and you got skunked, you didn't catch anything, yeah, you're into 15%, so it happens. Anyway, that, uh, that wraps up Unit 2, and I hope you've in, in, uh, in, in enjoyed this. And we will move on to Unit 2 Equipment, which is, should be just a rip-roaring good time. So I thank you for your attention, and everyone stay safe.